Okay, it is five o'clock, so if you're all right, Tara, we'll get started. Uh, absolutely, go right ahead. Perfect. So hello everyone, my name is Verity Martin and I'm the Municipal Advisor for York Region with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I'd also like to introduce my colleague Bridget Foster who will be presenting with me this evening. I'd also like to thank the Town of East Gwillimbury for hosting us this evening and thank you and congratulations to all of you for taking an interest in municipal governance. This presentation is intended to give you a high level overview of how municipal governments function, the roles and responsibilities of council, candidate eligibility requirements, and the rules you must follow as you conduct your campaign. These slides are very information dense and we will not cover everything in detail. However, a recording of this presentation and a copy of this deck will be made available on East Quillenberry's elections webpage. We encourage you to refer to these slides and the ministry provided candidates and third party guides throughout this process. Next slide, please. Please note that these slides are intended to summarize some sections of the Municipal Act and should not be relied upon for legal or official purposes. In that same vein, we are not lawyers and any legal matter should be referred to legal counsel. Next slide, please. This slide offers a brief outline of the topics that will be covered during this section. This deck will only cover issues covered in provincial acts, such as the Municipal Elections Act and the Municipal Act. The legislation does not address election signs, which are a municipal responsibility, and information about local rules will be made available by your local municipal clerk who oversees the municipal election. Next slide, please. Section 2 of the Municipal Act stipulates that municipalities are created by the province to be responsible and accountable governments with respect to matters within their jurisdiction, and each municipality is given powers and duties under the Municipal Act and other pieces of legislation for the purpose of providing good government. The Municipal Act is a legislative framework for municipalities which seeks to balance local autonomy and flexibility with accountability and transparency of municipal operations. The key to any organization, government, business, industry, or local service club is for everyone to understand their respective roles and relationships. In the next few slides, we are going to review the role of the mayor, the mayor's role as the chief executive officer, the role of council, and the role of municipal staff, which are all key to an effective and efficient local government. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Municipal councils are a collective body where each member, including the mayor or head of council, have one vote. Councils act as the political arm of municipal government. They are public facing and accountable to the voter. Next slide. These slides provide a high level overview of the roles and responsibilities of council, and I would encourage you to review them when you have time. Next slide. It is the role of council to conduct meetings, pass bylaws, and develop policies with respect to matters within their jurisdiction. Next slide, please. The mayor or head of council operates as a regular member of council with a few additional responsibilities as outlined in this slide. The mayor is a public facing representative of council presiding over meetings and fulfilling the duties of a head of council as outlined in the municipal act. Next slide, please. While the mayor or head of council acts as the municipality's chief executive officer, the role is more akin to that of the chairman of the board in a business context. Next slide. If council is the political arm of municipal governments, municipal staff act as the administrative arm. Staff are responsible for implementing council decisions and supporting the decision-making process by providing background research and advice to council. There are some municipal staff positions that have statutory obligations the clerk, treasurer, chief building official, and fire chief. It is important that council not interfere with the statutory obligations of those roles. For example, the clerk and treasurer positions have statutory duties or responsibilities assigned to them under the Municipal Act or other pieces of legislation. The Building Code Act would define statutory duties for the chief building official, and the Fire Prevention and Protection Act would define statutory duties for the fire chief. It is important to remember that while council and staff work together, municipal staff are not council staff and should receive direction from the chief administrative officer. Next slide, please. While the head of council is akin to the chairman of the board in a business environment, the CAO is the chief executive officer. They are responsible for general control and day-to-day -day management of municipal operations. They also act as the bridge between council and staff, taking requests, decisions, and direction from municipal council and delegating work to staff. Next slide, please. 
The counselor's guide provides some very useful information on how high council and staff can work together. This provide, slide provides you with a high level overview of that relationship. It is a relationship that is interconnected and is important for council members and staff to respect one another's roles so that they can serve the public in an effective and efficient manner. Municipalities are required to adopt a policy on the relationship between members of councils and, and municipal staff. Municipalities have the flexibility to determine the content of these policies, and I would recommend that you review your local policy before running for council. Next slide, please. Counselors have three distinct but interconnected roles. They are representatives, policymakers, and stewards of the municipality. In your role as representative, you are elected by your constituents to represent their views when dealing with issues that come before council. However, your constituents have many views and opinions and you cannot represent all of them all of the time. For many issues, you will have to consider a variety of opposing interests and make decisions that will not be popular with everyone. You should use your judgment and decide based on the interests of the municipality as a whole. Be sure to familiarize yourself with any policies or protocols that your municipality may have in place regarding the handling of complaints and citizen inquiries. Although you may want to find some way of helping, remember to consult municipal staff. If your municipality doesn't already have a complaint policy, council may want to consider adopting one. Furthermore, there may be circumstances where decisions are made by designated staff that operate at an arm's length from the municipality and where it could be seen as inappropriate for elected officials to interfere or be seen to be interfering. Examples of this would include decisions made by the fire chief, the chief building official, or the medical officer of health. A counselor who has made promises that cannot be kept may lose credibility with the citizens and strain the working relationship with staff. As I mentioned before, each council member has one vote when making decisions. Every member of council should vote on matters in the best interest of the municipality as a whole, and every member should respect each other's points of view during and after debating an issue at the council table. Once a decision is made by council, it is a decision of the municipality and staff are required to carry it out. Next slide, please. Some council decisions are routine and others establish general principles to help guide future actions. These decisions are often considered policy decisions. Some policies can be specific, such as a bylaw requiring dogs to be kept on a leash in public areas, and others can be broader and more general, such as the approval of an official plan. This slide outlines the general process undertaken during the policymaking rule. Next slide, please. There is a fine line between council's overall stewardship of the municipality and the administration's management of day-to-day -day activities. Generally, council monitors the implementation of its approved policies and programs, but the practical aspects of its implementation and administration are a staff responsibility. Essentially, the day-to-day -day operations of the municipality are left up to staff. Before Council can monitor and measure the municipality's administrative effectiveness and efficiency, it may wish to become familiar with policies currently in place. With input from municipal staff, Council can determine whether the policies are functioning well or if changes are necessary. Next slide, please. Strengthening accountability and transparency in municipal governments is a high priority file for the provincial government, and Section 222 of the Municipal Act makes ensuring transparency a responsibility of Council. Councillors are, of course, accountable to the public as elected officials. However, it is also important that procedures and policies are clearly set out and accessible and that the day-to-day -day operations of the municipality are transparent. Next slide, please. Codes of conduct usually set out expectations and standards for councillor conduct. You may wish to familiarize yourself with your local code of conduct prior to running for municipal office. Next slide, please. Municipalities are required to provide access to an integrity commissioner who operates independently of council and reports to council with respect to the application of a code of conduct of members of council and local boards, procedures, rules, and policies governing the ethical behavior of members of council and local boards. They may also provide advice and education about the code and other ethical rules to members of council and, pu and the public, as well as conducting inquiries into requests from council or a local board. If the integrity commissioner reports that, in their opinion, a member of council has contravened the code of conduct, the municipality may impose a penalty in the form of a reprimand or a suspension of pay for up to a period of up to 90 days. It is up to the municipality to decide how to proceed after the integrity commissioner's report. Next slide, please. 
The Ontario Ombudsman may investigate municipalities when a complaint is received or on the Ombudsman's own initiative. Although the Ontario Ombudsman may investigate, they cannot compel municipalities to take action. The Ombudsman may make recommendations to Council and the municipality is part of their report, but it is up to the municipality whether and how to address any recommendations made by the Ombudsman. Next slide, please. Personal privacy and other confidentiality issues are an important practical and legal consideration for municipal councillors and staff. The Municipal Freedom and Information and Pri Protection of Privacy Act is the primary statute for privacy and confidentiality. It sets out rules for collection, use and disclosure of personal information. According to these rules, councillors and staff in most circumstances protect personal privacy and only collect, use and disclose personal information in accordance with those rules. For example, depending on circumstances, counselors and staff may or may not be authorized to obtain personal information in the course of their duties. Municipal Freedom of Information legislation also regulates confidential information of other kinds. Other laws, including local bylaws, also regulate personal and other kinds of confidential information. Counselors who have received personal or other confidential information in the course of their duties will have related responsibilities, such as protecting and safeguarding the information. Councillors may wish to check with municipal staff about appropriate measures and the municipality's practices. Next slide, please. In order to run for council, you must be an eligible elector, which means you must be able to vote. The list above shows voter eligibility as well as eligibility to run and hold office. You can only be nominated if, as of the day you are nominated, you are qualified to hold that office under the Act and are not ineligible under the Municipal Elections Act or any other Act as otherwise prohibited by law to be nominated or to hold the office. Next slide, please. The Education Act creates four kinds of different school boards, which are detailed on this slide. School trustees are members of the, of the school board. They are locally elected representatives of the public, and they are the community's advocate for public education. Only the board, not an individual trustee, has the authority to make decisions or take action. A trustee is often the first point of contact for parents and community members who have questions or concerns about their local school. Next slide, please. The role of a school board trustee is to establish policy direction and participate in making decisions that benefit the entire school board while representing the interests of constituents. School board trustees are accountable to constituents, families, and the Ontario Ministry of Education. If you would like more information about the duties and commitments associated with being a school board trustee, please contact the applicable school board. School board. Next slide, please. If you are an employee of any school board and you are running for school board trustee, you must take an unpaid leave of absence before filing your nomination form, even if you are running in a different board than the one in which you work. If elected, you must resign your position. Next slide, please. A third party advertiser is an individual corporation or trade union that is registered in the municipality to promote, support or oppose a candidate. TPAs can also promote, promote, support, or oppose a yes or no question to a question on the ballot. However, there are no ballot questions in East Gwillimbury this election. There are also eligibility rules for third-party advertisers. Next slide. Only the following persons and entities are eligible to file a notice of registration. An individual who is normally a resident in Ontario, a corporation that carries on business in Ontario, or a trade union that holds bargaining rights for employees in Ontario. In addition to not being able to register, groups that are not corporations also cannot do third-party advertising during the restricted period. Although spouses and candidates, family members and campaign staff are not prohibited from registering as third-party advertisers, there may be optics issues. Please remember that third-party advertising cannot be conducted under the instruction of a candidate, and if you face a compliance audit, you will need to be able to prove that this has not occurred. Next slide, please. The official first day for filing nominations is May 1st, 2022. However, this is a Sunday and you will not be able to file until Monday, May 2nd. The last day and time for filing nominations for the 2022 elections is on Friday, August 19th by 2 p.m. There is a fee associated with filing, which is refunded once the candidate submits a completed financial disclosure for all financial transactions made up to the date of the nomination was withdrawn. 
The filing fee is $200 for anyone running for head of council and $100 for all other offices. If you change your mind and wish to withdraw your nomination, there are rules that must be followed. Please refer to the candidate's guide for more detailed information. Next slide, please. In addition to the legislative requirements, each municipal clerk may establish their own local processes and procedures related to submitting a nomination, so it is important to contact the clerk so you understand the process in your municipality. If your nomination is not certified by the clerk, your name will not appear on the ballot. As long as you are eligible to vote in the municipality, you may run in any ward, but if you do not run in the ward in which you live, you will not be able to vote for yourself. All campaign documents require original signatures, including signatures endorsing candidates' nominations, and the original records must be maintained until after the next regular election in 2026. Next slide, please. Municipal Council candidates are required to obtain 25 nomination signatures on Form 2. School Board candidates are not required to do this. Nominators can nominate more than one candidate and are not required to vote for that candidate. They must meet the eligibility requirements of a municipal elector at the time they sign the nomination form and can be anyone who is eligible to vote in the municipality, not just the ward. Both the clerk and the candidate are entitled to rely upon the information provided by the nominator, meaning you are solely responsible for ensuring the signatures will be viewed as legitimate in the case of a challenge. If the nominator does not meet the eligibility requirements when they sign the document, they could be held accountable under the penalty section of the Municipal Elections Act. In order to ensure that there are no issues later on, you may wish to provide more than 25 signatures on Form 2. This way, if you provide 30 signatures and five are found to be ineligible, your candidacy would still be legitimate. Next slide, please. Candidates may change their mind and decide to run for a different office. If you file a second nomination, your first will automatically be deemed withdrawn. If a candidate decides to run for another office and they have already collected the 25 endorsement signatures, they can use these endorsements for the other office. If a candidate decides to run for a different office on the same council or school board and both positions are elected at large, meaning by the municipality as a whole, everything from the first campaign is transferred to the second campaign and only one financial statement needs to be filed. If the candidate decides to run for a different office on the same council or school board and one or both of these offices is elected by ward, the two campaigns must be kept separate and two financial statements must be filed. Next slide, please. Individuals, corporations, and trade unions may register to be third-party advertisers and can do so through the municipal clerk. A notice of registration to be a registered third-party advertiser for the election must be filed in the prescribed form and must include a declaration of qualification signed by the individual or made by a representative of the corporation or trade union, as the case may be. There is no registration fee for third-party advertisers. Once registered, they may advertise in support of or in opposition to any candidate being elected by voters in the municipality. This would include council, trustee, and directly elected upper tier candidates. Any person or entity may advertise regarding an issue related to elections that municipality without registering. However, advertising regarding questions on the ballot will require registration as a third party advertiser. Once the clerk certifies the notice of registration, the individual corporation or trade union is a registered third party for the election within the boundaries of the municipality in which it was filed. If a TPA is registered in East Gwillimbury and they also want to influence voters in Markham, they would have to file a second notice of registration with the municipal clerk in Markham. The MEA empowers municipalities to, if they are satisfied that there has been a contravention of the act, ask third party advertisers to remove or discontinue the advertisement. Next slide, please. The third party advertiser's registration is deemed to be withdrawn if they file a nomination. This means that their advertising campaign would automatically end when they file their nomination. If a corporation or trade union is registered as a third party advertiser, it would not be affected by a person within the corporation or union filing a nomination as the person would not be the same entity. I want to again emphasize that third party advertising may not take place under the direction of a candidate. So in this situation, you need to be very careful to clearly distance your activities. Finances related to a third party advertising campaign cannot be transferred to a candidate's campaign. A third party advertiser who withdraws and closes their campaign cannot transfer that campaign to someone else. And to maintain financial transparency around third 
Free advertising campaigns, the financial statement of advertisers who end their campaign early should be reflected in their finances as of the day their campaign ended. Next slide, please. If you intend to spend any amount of money during your campaign, you need to open a campaign bank account. Only in the case of acclamations and campaigns where no funds are raised or spent is there a no need for a campaign account. Trade unions and corporations are not eligible to contribute to a candidate's campaign, although they can participate in the election as third party advertisers or make contributions to third party advertising campaigns. Municipalities must establish rules and procedures regarding the use of municipal or local board resources during the election, the campaign period. This must be passed by May 1st in the year of the election. This will encourage accountability and transparency, so ensure you are aware of the municipality's policy in this regard. The practice of municipalities providing candidate contact information on their websites is not a contribution. Next slide. Candidates can only accept contributions from individuals who are normally residents of Ontario and from themselves and their spouse. Please remember it is the responsibility of the candidate to ensure that contributions are only accepted from eligible contributors. Third party advertisers may accept contributions from individuals normally residing in Ontario, trade unions that hold bargaining rights for employees in Ontario, and corporations that carry on business in Ontario. Corporations are deemed to be a single corporation if one of the corporations controls the other directly or indirectly, or if all of the corporations are owned or controlled by the same person or group of persons, either directly or indirectly. Next slide, please. This slide provides some information on who candidates and TPAs cannot accept contributions from. As mentioned previously, only TPAs can accept contributions from corporations and unions, the value of services provided by volunteers is generally not considered to be a contribution. However, if a volunteer provides a service in which, for which they are usually paid, the market value of the service must be recorded as a contribution and as a campaign expense. To clarify, if your friend is a professional web de designer and they build your website for you for free, you must record the regular fee that they would charge as a contribution and issue a receipt for that contribution. If you have a friend who is an interior designer and they like to build websites for fun, they can help you design their website and you do not need to record it as a contribution. Next slide, please. Campaign contributions are monies, goods, or services given to a candidate for their election campaign. This includes an amount charged for admission to a fundraising function, any amount you or your spouse contribute to your campaign, both of which contribute to self-funding limit, the profit generated from goods and services sold for a higher than market price and for over $25 as a fundraising function. The difference between the market price for a good or service and the price paid, so if you have a friend who prints t-shirts for $6 a shirt and they sell them to you for $2 a shirt, you would have to claim $4 a shirt as a contribution and also in your campaign expenses, make sure you're noting down $6 a shirt. And additionally, any unpaid but guaranteed balance in respect to a loan, which I'll talk a little bit more about shortly. Cash contributions may only be accepted up to $25 and if collected in a pass the hat collection at an event may be made anonymously. All contributions in excess of $25 must be made by check, money order, or any other method that clearly shows where funds came from, such as an e-transfer. You must issue a receipt for all contributions, accepting anonymous cash contributions made during a pass the hat collection at an event. This includes contributions made via the purchase of a ticket for a fundraising event. Receipts must include the name and address of the contributor, the amount and the date. I encourage you to be meticulous in your tracking of contributions. Keep a spreadsheet for all your contributions, keep copies of all receipts, number your receipts so they are easy to keep track of. It is very important that you be able to demonstrate where all of your money came from and where it was spent. Next slide, please. The limit on contributions to any one candidate or registered CPA is $1,200, except for City of Toronto mayoral candidates, in which case the amount is $2,500. The individual contribution amount has increased from $750 to $1,200, but the aggregate amount of $5,000, which is the total amount someone can donate to candidates running in the same election, stays the same. 
Candidates and third party advertisers are required to inform contributors of contribution limits, so you may wish to include these limits on your receipts. When you receive a contribution on a joint account check, you must determine which of the jointed parties are making the contribution for receiving purposes. If both wish to make individual contributions, they must provide separate checks for each contribution. You are required to return any contribution that was made or accepted in contravention of the MEA as soon as you learn that it was an ineligible contribution. If you cannot return the contribution, you must turn it over to the clerk. Next slide, please. Any cash, goods, or services contributed to your campaign by you and your spouse count towards your self-funding limit. Self-funding limits for municipal council candidates based on the number, are based on the number of electors voting for the office to a maximum of $25,000 per candidate. If you choose to take out a personal loan to kickstart your campaign and it is not repaid in full with money raised, the remaining balance is considered to be a contribution and will count towards your self-funding limit. The formula for calculating your limit is on the slide, which you can refer back to at any time. The clerk will also let you know what your self-funding limit is when your nomination is filed, and again, when the voters list is solidified in September. The higher of those two numbers will be your final funding limit. There are no self-funding limits for school board candidates or third-party advertisers. Next slide. You are permitted to obtain a personal loan to kickstart your campaign. You cannot receive a loan from family members or from any corporate accounts that you have access to. You also cannot loan a campaign your own funds. A loan is not considered a campaign expense, nor is paying it back, but any interest paid on the loan is a campaign expense and must be noted in financial statements. It is important to note that if you take out a loan and are unable to raise sufficient funds to pay back the loan, you are personally responsible for paying back the loan and the amount you must pay back will contribute to your self-funding limit. Because of this, I would encourage you not to contribute both the full value of your self-funding limit and take out a loan. You have no way of knowing how much money you will raise and you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you have to pay back some of the money yourself and you have no room left in your self-funding limit. I also want to emphasize, as this question does get asked, that regardless of the outcome of the election, you must pay the loan back. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to Bridget, who will be guiding you through the remainder of the deck. Okay. So next slide, please. Candidates and third party advertisers should familiarize, familiarize themselves with the campaign expense provisions and know what constitutes an expense under their spending limits. These can be found in the candidate's guide. Campaign expenses are costs that are incurred by the candidate or a person under the candidate's direction, such as a campaign manager, along with a third party advertiser and their campaign. The nomination fee is a personal expense and not a campaign expense. Therefore, it should not be reported on your financial statement. All expenses must be paid from your campaign bank account and a receipt must be retained that shows what the expense was, was for. If you are using a credit card to pay for purchases, you should make sure you keep clear records showing that the expense on the credit card was reimbursed from the campaign account. Candidates are subject to two spending limits, a general limit and a separate limit for expenses relating to parties and expressions of appreciation after voting day. The spending limit related to parties and appreciation shall not be the greater than should not be greater than 10% of the total spending limit. Some expenses are not subject to the general spending limit, such as audit and accounting fees, expenses relating to a recount and compliance audit, and expenses relating to holding a fundraising event or activity. Next slide, please. Goods and services donated to the campaign are also expenses and must be reported. A receipt must be provided for fair market value and treated as a contribution. With respect to campaign inventory, if you ran in the last election and want to use leftover goods such as signs or office supplies, you have to determine the current market value for those goods and record them as an expense in the current campaign. Also, if you end up with leftover inventory at the end of this campaign, it becomes your personal property. But if you want to store them to use in another election, any costs for storage are not considered campaign expenses. Next slide, please. The spending limit formula for candidates and maximum amount for parties after voting day are set out in Ontario Regulation 101-97. The clerk calculates the spending limits twice. The 
first time upon a candidate filing the nomination form, the clerk will calculate the spending limit based on the number of electors on the voters list as it existed on September 15th, 2018. The second time, the calculation is based on the number of electors on the voters list as it exists on September 15th, 2022. Note this calculation is provided to candidates on or before September 25th, 2022. Whichever number is higher is the spending limit and the clerk's calculation is final. Next slide, please. Candidates will be required to inform their contributors of the contribution limits. For example, how much a contributor can contribute to an individual's campaign, being 1,200 and the aggregate limit on contributions to any one council or local board election being 5,000. Final spending limit will be provided to candidates by September 25th. If a third party advertiser has registered in more than one municipality, each registration is a separate campaign with its own spending limits. If there is a joint purchase spanning over more than one municipality, then portion a reasonable amount for each registration. The campaign finance rules are generally the same for third party advertisers as they are for candidates. This includes financial filing requirements, requests for extensions and records. Third party advertisers are also required to ensure contributions and expenses are tracked and accounted for. Proper record retention, proper direction is provided to those incurring expenses or accepting contributions on their behalf and that spending limits are adhered to. Next slide, please. Most expenses are subject to the spending limit. Those listed in the slide are not. For example, expenses related to a recount or to a compliance audit. Expenses related to fundraising functions are exempt from the campaign spending limit, but in order to qualify as a fundraising function, an event must have the raising of money as its primary purpose. Campaign events at which incidental fundraising takes place do not qualify as fundraising functions. Similarly, a brochure promoting awareness of a candidate that contains contact information to make campaign contributions does not qualify as a fundraising function. Expenses that were subject to the spending limit if incurred before voting day are not subject to the spending limit if incurred after voting day. For example, expenses related to a compliance audit or court action for a controverted election and expenses incurred after voting day. Next slide, please. Third party advertisers will be subject to two spending limits, a general spending limit and a separate limit for expenses related to parties and expressions of appreciation after close of voting. The Municipal Elections Act also provides that the spending limit for parties and other expressions of appreciation after voting day be set at 10% of the general spending limit. This would be consistent with the spending limit in place for candidates. Next slide, please. As a candidate or a third party advertiser, it is important that you are fully aware of the responsibilities regarding election spending and accepting campaign contributions. The candidate's guide is a good resource as well as sections 88.8 through to 88.21 of the Municipal Elections Act and be familiar with the financial statements that you will be required to complete at the end of your campaign period. This will help guide you in organizing your records and how they have to be reported. A question we are asked each municipal election is whether there is a requirement for every candidate to have a chief financial officer. The answer is no. You are required under the Municipal Elections Act to keep accurate records and open a campaign bank account if you are spending any money or accepting any contributions. Please note a bank account is not required if a candidate or third party advertiser does not receive nor spend money. Next slide, please. Candidates and third party advertisers are required to keep complete and accurate financial statements during the course of their campaigns. All contributions and expenses are to be accounted for and disclosed by the candidate on the relevant prescribed financial form. All candidates and third party advertisers are required to keep all original campaign financial records until after November 15th, 2026, when a new council takes office. These rules apply whether you were elected or not. Next slide, please. Store receipts in a secure place as they are valuable documents and they may need to be produced in the event of a compliance audit. Receipts must be signed by the candidate or his or her designate. It is good practice to have a receipt that is a multi-part form, one for the contributor and one or more for the candidate's records. 
Receipts should be numbered in sequence. Open a bank account which provides monthly statements and canceled checks. Produce duplicate deposit slips for every deposit, listing the names of the contributors and the amounts received from each. Ensure a very good record is kept of all contributions as sometimes a, con a contributor makes numerous contributions and may reach the $100 limit where they will need to be identified within the financial statement. Maintain a petty cash fund to handle minor expenses and obtain invoices to support all payments from the fund. At any time, the cash on hand plus the total amount of the invoices should equal the original amount of the petty cash fund. The fund can be replenished periodically by a check drawn on the campaign account in an amount equal to the total amount of the invoices. Candidates and third party advertisers may find it useful to look over the financial statement forms being form four for the candidate and form eight for the third party advertiser respectively at the beginning of their campaign to give them an idea of what information will be required to report at the end of the campaign. Requirements under the Municipal Elections Act states you must maintain original records until November 15, 2026. Next slide, please. It is recommended for candidates to contact their municipality, both upper and lower, to ask about bylaws relating to signs and campaigning. The period for third party advertisers, as shown on the slide, is the period when the rules for third party advertisers applies. In 2022, that is from May 1st until the close of voting at 8 p.m. on October 24th, 2022. Please note, third party advertisers and candidates are required to identify themselves on all signs and advertisements. The Municipal Elections Act references for advertising is for candidates section 88.3 and third party advertisers under section 88.4. Next slide, please. The broadcaster or publisher of a third party or a candidate advertisement shall maintain records containing the following information for a period of four years for the public to inspect. The name of the candidate or registered third party advertiser, name, business address, and telephone number of the individual who deals with a broadcaster or publisher under the direction of the candidate or third party advertiser, copy of the advertisement or the means of reproducing it for inspection, and a statement of the change made for its appearance, other of the charge made for the appearance, for the, its appearance. Next slide, please. Section 88.25 of the Municipal Elections Act states all candidates are required to file Form 4 with the clerk, regardless of how much or how little they spent or fundraised. If you filed a nomination form, you must file a Form 4. This form is required even if you withdrew your nomination or were acclaimed. If you registered as a third party advertiser, you must complete Form 8. A candidate may resubmit a financial statement to correct an error up until the filing deadline of March 31st. 2023. The clerk is required to make public a report that states which candidates filed financial statements and which did not. Next slide, please. The appointment of an auditor by the candidate is mandatory if expenses or contributions exceed $10,000. The auditor must be licensed under the Public Accounting Act 2004. Note that campaign statements are public documents and anyone contributing $100 or more will be identified on the financial statement that will be made public. Next slide, please. Candidates can file their financial documents at any time after voting day to January 3rd, 2023. Filing the financial statement ends the campaign period. This will make it easier for acclamations and campaigns where little or no expense is incurred. Clerks will be required to report whether candidates have met their fi financial filing obligation and publish a report on the MISA website or in another electronic form. This needs to be done by April 30th in the case of a regular election or within 30 days of a by-election. Clerks can determine the conditions for the electronic filing or financial statements. Next slide, please. The nomination fee is only refundable if the financial statement is filed on time. A candidate or third party advertiser who misses the filing deadline may file within the 30 day grace period, provided a $500 late fee, late filing fee is paid to the municipality. Please note a candidate who chooses to file within this 30 day grace period will be subject to both the $500 late filing fee as well as the loss of their nomination refund. A candidate or third party advertiser may 
we submit a financial statement to correct an error up until the filing deadline of March 31st. Next slide, please. When filing the financial statement, a candidate or third party advertiser with a campaign surplus must pay the entire amount to the clerk. Prior to paying over any surplus funds to the clerk, a candidate or third party advertiser is entitled to a refund of any contributions they or their spouse made to the campaign, not to anybody else. The amount that may be refunded is the lesser of the amount of the relevant contribution or the amount of the surplus. For example, if there is a surplus of $500 and the total contributions made by the candidate was $400, the candidate would be entitled to $400 and the remaining $100 will be given to the clerk of the municipality. The clerk is required to place surplus monies in trust for use by the candidate or third party advertiser if they need it for a compliance audit. If neither, of the, if neither the candidate nor the third party advertiser requires the funds for these purposes, it becomes a property of the municipality or school board. Next slide, please. Every council and school board must establish a compliance audit committee. Members of a compliance audit committee cannot be members of the council or school board, an employee, a candidate in the election, or a registered third party advertiser. Clerk reviews contributions and prepares a report for consideration by the compliance audit committee if a contributor appears to have exceeded any contribution limits. This process is related to reviewing contributions as reported on the financial statements and is not connected to the compliance audit process. If it is apparent to the clerk that a, con that a contributor has exceeded one or more of the contribution limits, the clerk would report this to the committee, which would meet to determine whether to proceed with legal action. The legislation does not specify what details are to be provided in the report to the committee. Ele electors entitled to vote in an election may apply for a compliance audit even if the candidate has not filed a financial statement. The application must be in writing and set out the electors reasons for why they believe the Municipal Elections Act has been contravened. The application must be submitted to the municipal clerk or the secretary of the school board within 90 days of the filing deadline. The compliance audit committee will consider the application and decide whether to retain an auditor to undertake a compliance audit of the candidate's financial return. Next slide please. The Compliance Audit Committee is required to provide brief written reasons for its decision. Compliance Audit Committee meetings are required to be open to the public, but the committee may deliberate in private. Electors can apply for a compliance audit of a third party advertiser's campaign finances as well. The minister has the authority to make a regulation setting out qualifications for compliance audit committee members. The written reasons for the committee's decision shall be given to the candidate the clerk with whom the candidate filed his or her nomination, the secretary of the local school board, if applicable, and the applicant. If an audit occurs, the report must be circulated to the same individuals. The campaign audit committee considers the auditor's report. If the compliance audit determines there have there has been an apparent contravention of the Municipal Elections Act, the committee will decide whether to proceed with legal action. Decisions of the committee may be appealed to the Superior Court of Justice. A person who believes that a candidate has contravened the Municipal Elections Act may proceed with legal, with legal action without having first obtained a compliance audit. Next slide, please. An offense as, as described in Section 90, Subsection 3, defines a corrupt practice and a person who commits it is, on conviction, disqualified from voting at an election until the next regular election has taken place after the election to which the offense relates, in addition to being liable to any other penalty provided for in this act. Next slide, please. In general, the penalties listed in this slide are available to the courts upon conviction uh, for an offense under the Municipal Elections Act. Just to note, ineligibility to vote is a penalty if you are convicted of a corrupt practice. See section 90 of the Municipal Elections Act. Next slide, please. Section 23 states the clerk shall not provide a copy of the voters list under subsection 3 or part of the voters list under subsection 4 until September 1st. Next slide please. Candidates running in a ward are entitled only to that portion of the list that contains the names of the electors entitled to vote for that office. If asked on written request, the clerk shall provide a copy of the voters list to the secretary of the school board clerk of the municipality responsible for conducting the school board elections for the area, 
upper tier clerk if members are required to be elected at an election conducted by the clerk or that has submitted a bylaw or question to the electors. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, if minister has submitted a question to the electors, which is very rare. Candidates can only receive the part of the voters list that contains the names of the electors entitled to vote for that office. For example, if there are awards, the, the ward candidate would be entitled only to that ward portion of the voters list. Next slide, please. The clerk may require anyone that has received a copy of the voters list to sign a receipt acknowledging the list is only to be used for election purposes and any other use would be in violation of the Municipal Elections Act. In a ward system, again, electors is entitled to vote or in a ward system, an elector is entitled to vote only in the ward where he or she resides. Next slide, please. There are a number of reasons why someone would appoint someone else to vote on their behalf, including absence from the area or an illness. No appointments for proxies are made until all nominations are closed. Assignment of proxy vote is the responsibility of an eligible voter to appoint an identified eligible voter. An eligible proxy may exercise only one proxy vote unless the proxy is acting on behalf of a spouse, sibling, parent, child, grandparent, or grandchild. Proxy forms must have original signatures. Please check with the municipal clerk if proxy voting is available as municipalities that use alternative voting may not permit proxy voting. Next slide, please. Only a candidate may appoint scrutineers to represent him or her during the voting and the counting of votes, including during a recount. Third party advertisers cannot appoint scrutineers. It is the traditional in a traditional election where voting takes place at a poll. The deputy returning officer is in charge of the activity in the voting place and the deputy returning officer may ask the scrutineer to leave if the scrutineer is not complying with the legislation. Candidates or scrutineers should respect that the deputy returning officer must ensure fairness, access, privacy, and security of the vote, and absolutely no campaigning within the voting place is to take place. This means scrutineers cannot enter the voting place wearing a pin or shirt with any reference to candidates. A useful tip would be to check with the clerk to see if a list of scrutineers' rights is being given to election staff at the poll. If so, use that list or prepare your own and hand out to each of your scrutineers a list of their rights, which are spelled out in section 47, subsection 5 of the Municipal Elections Act. There are no age restrictions for scrutineers. Next slide, please. A recount is automatic if the vote is tied. Councils and school boards have the option of establishing policies prior to the election that also allow for an automatic recount. Council still retains the option to pass a resolution for a recount within 30 days after the clerk has declared the results of the election. An eligible elector can apply to the courts for a recount within 30 days of the clerk's declaration of the results. Next slide, please. So this is a list of some key dates. Voting day is Monday, October 24th between 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. The campaign period, the time when a candidate can access contribution or accept contributions and incur election, election expenses, runs from the date the nomination is submitted up until January 3rd, 2023. The campaign period, the time a third party advertiser can incur expenses, begins on the date the registration is certified the earliest being May 1st until January 3rd, 2023. The deadline for filing of the campaign financial statement in the clerk's office is Friday, March 31st, 2023, no later than 2 p.m. All candidates and third party advertisers must file this statement regardless of how much they spent or received in contributions. Next slide, please. This lists the resources that are available to you in order to be prepared for your campaign. The first section of links will take you to the e-laws website where all provincial legislation is available online including the associated regulations. You want to be very familiar with the Municipal Elections Act, the Municipal Act, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, and if running for school board, the election, the Education Act. The second link is to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing website. From this site, you will be able to access the 2022 Voters Guide, Candidates Guide, and Third Party Advertisers Guide. The next one is the Municipal World website, where you will find a list of books that can also help you in your campaign. Next slide, please. Um, so 
but this is the end of our presentation. Um, Verity, did you want to do that? Awesome, thanks so much, Bridget. Um, I know that we have people joining us in a variety of different ways tonight, um, but it, does anyone who's either in person in the council chambers or on Teams right now have any questions we can answer? Very. Um, I have just confirmed uh, with uh, individuals in attendance. We have received no questions or comments at this time uh, from in-person attendance. We do have a number of individuals on the call as participants, but I don't see any hand raises. Okay, perfect. Well, if something occurs to you later on, my contact information is on the slide there. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about campaigning going forward. And of course, if you have any specific questions about the elections process or in anything that would be specific to the municipality, I would encourage you to reach out to them directly. Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation. I'm sure if any individual has any types of questions, they can always reach out to the town or um, through the contact information you've provided on this slide. What we will be doing following tonight's meeting is making the live stream of recording available on our town's YouTube channel. And subsequent to that, we will be also placing uh, the live stream content recording as well as the presentation material on the town's website uh, on our dedicated 2022 municipal webpage. Uh, so stay tuned and that will be updated shortly within the next few days. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.